Peace, power, and love. Prosperity is your one and only. Constant Sheshmo Amun with Team Osiris. Team Osiris is always on the horizon. And we're back with another uh, moment of research that uh, one of our brothers, uh, well, a couple of our brothers have put together um, in regards to the topic of linguistics. And this particular um, topic is specifically concerning the Negro Egyptian theory that was implemented by Jean Claude um, Mboli and his theory of a Negro Egyptian language phylum. Um, there is a book that. Um, Mr. Mboli had uh, written that is um, concerning this uh, topic, but it was written in French and it was not rendered uh, to the, the English language. So we, uh, a couple of our members took the time to find translators that translated this information to correctly um, um, disambiguate the information. There are some things that we're going to discuss in regards to it, and I'm going to give the floor to the brother Joshua Kane, who's going to uh, present to us this knowledge and information. I think it's going to be very beneficial. So I'll yield the floor to the brother Joshua. Go ahead, bro. Peace, peace. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. All right, I just want to say peace to the panel, peace to everybody listening, tuning in. Um this, yeah, this this presentation, like Kansu, like how you already uh, went over it. Uh it's about John Claude and Bowley's 2010 book, um, The Origin of the African Languages. And apparently this book was to have supposedly reclassified African languages for, I guess, the, the dark skin uh, population of Africa. And it supposedly debunked the previous language classifications um, from older works in, in uh, academia. So I guess we can get right into it. All right. So yeah, here it is. This is uh, The Origin of African Languages by John Claude Mboli. So before we get into it, here's just the outline of, of what, what uh, we'll be going over. So you got the introduction, which we already went over. Um, you got the background, the background of of why this is taking place. Uh, then you have languages discussed, chapter summaries, the premise of the book, which is very important to go over. And um, uh, we have uh, the analysis of his reconstruct reconstruction of Negro Egyptian. And throughout the book, we'll also be going over um, key principles of said linguistics and the comparative method. Um, uh, why previous linguistic classifications matter, uh, going over some uh, Afro-Asiatic and Niger-Congo features. Uh, what else? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's right there. It's, it's written on the screen. So this is basically what we'll be going, going over throughout this presentation. So. I guess we can move on unless anybody want to add something. No, go ahead, King. All right. Yeah, All right, so. and I'd like to, before we continue, I would like to welcome uh, Brother Melvin, Brother Tristan, and Brother Herb, members of Team Osiris, 
and intermittently we'll probably have some members join us, um, Brother Ngozi and uh, Brother Gucci Della. So uh, it'll be that'll be happening throughout the presentation. So go ahead, Joshua. All right. All right. So the background uh, of this presentation and why we're here today. Um, I'm just gonna go over these these screenshots. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is from a couple of years ago. So basically, these gentlemen are vouching for this uh, book that we're going over today. Um, uh, they say things like, uh, and don't be stuck on stupid, stop acting like this. Book doesn't exist. Who dares challenge it? Challenge the Amara squad. Oh, Timo Cyrus doesn't read. John Claude and Bully is uh, this this expert linguist, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why we're here today. I mean, you can read the screenshots for yourself. So look, in Bully, in Bully's book is the epitome of the historical comparative method. So now th this is a cosign from these individuals of John Claude and Bowley. So if you are willing to back back up a scholar, put your name or cosign a scholar, uh, hopefully that scholar is what you say he is. You know what I'm saying? So this is basically what we're going over. Is John Claude and Bowley the epitome of historical comparative method? Is he the world renowned African scholar that had, you know, has reclassified African languages? So this is all the background right here. Anybody want to add something? To, uh, yes, uh, to... I would like to add something. Um, uh, so this is basically recommendations of uh, this book. Yo, that... yo, 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 yo. Hey, right, peace, peace, peace. Uh, yes, uh, this is basically recommendations of, of John Claude and Bowley's book. Um, when it came to looking for you know, outside recommendations and reviews, uh, we only really found one that kind of uh, co-signed it. There was no necessary review based upon reading the book. Um, so these are individual recommendations from individuals who uh, is it to assume we did read the book? And so they kind of motivated uh, us wanting to check out the book since, you know, it's been highly recommended uh, and we have yet to, to read it and investigate it. So this is kind of like a motivation uh, for us to be able to inspect it. Right. Um... If anybody else doesn't, doesn't want to add anything else, I'll go ahead and say this. Um, if you follow Timo Cyrus' channel and our work, uh, we did a previous um, presentation in regards to a, a, another book written by one of the brothers um, from, from that side. Um, and uh, we, we got pretty positive reviews about that presentation, but a criticism that we received was, oh, we don't understand that particular book because we haven't read this particular book that we're discussing today. So um, this is, a, yeah, that, that's, that's probably the main reason why we're reading this book and going over it right now. So, all right, so, Going over the languages discussed today, you got uh, you got Sango. Sango is is uh, a language spoken in the Central African Republic. Uh, it's, it's it's a Creole language, uh, but according to this book, it's not, as we'll see later on. But yeah, this is one of the languages discussed. You got Zande. Zande is a language spoken in Central Africa, also. Uh, in the Dem also in the Democratic uh, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan. 
you got Somali. And uh, keep in mind that these languages are somewhat already classified as of today. Like Somali is classified as a, a, as a low e, lowland Eastern Cushitic language. Uh, Zande is somewhat classified as Nadja Congo. Uh, Sango is a Creole. You have the Hausa language. Hausa is a chatted language of the Afro-Asiatic language phylum. And last but not least, probably the reason why we're here is because the author and many other authors have tried to make connections with ancient Egyptian and, um, and uh, the Coptic language. <clears throat> so these six languages are the languages at question. Uh, yes. Um, also, I'd like to add uh, uh, these six languages were specifically picked um, to challenge you know, the, the current set of the different language phylums. Um, they, they specifically were chosen to show comparisons uh, between uh, what's conceived as Negro Egyptian. And so you'll see later on in the presentation how he makes those comparisons. But these aren't just randomly selected languages. He actually specifically yeah. pinpointed them. Hey, yo, yo, hold on, bro. My, I spilled some drink on my, my laptop. This shit doing this right now. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is exactly why you can't go live. See, look at this bullshit, bro. Look at this. Damn. You might want to get like a towel. Or you can continue, Constant. All right. We had some uh, technical difficulty, everybody. So, excuse, uh, please excuse the abrupt editing, but uh, we're back and ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, so, as we said uh, previously, uh, the languages were selected uh, to be compared uh, between each other, uh, comparing the consonants and the vowels, uh, as well as uh, the syllables and tones between all of them uh, to find the mats. Uh, this is basically uh, why they were chosen. It's because they have some similarities that uh, he says that connect them together. Um, this also, because of these comparisons, this also uh, disagrees with the current consensus of, of Afroasiatic and Magic Congo. Uh, so this would be something that, again, you further see in the PowerPoint how he expresses why they match. But um, yes, you can go ahead. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right. So uh, next is like the chapter summer. Summaries, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, chapter one just goes on to like the history of, of African linguistics. And it, he touched on it very briefly, like chapter one is not that long at all. And you have a couple of quotes right here, which I'm not going to read, but it's not really that important. Chapter two, um, now he goes over more in, more in depth of the history of African linguistics, the previous reconstructions, and he gives somewhat of a criticism of the previous classifications and some of those criticisms, which some were misrepresented, some were overblown, some were correct. And, um, what was kind of ironic about some of the correct criticisms um, that he had on the previous classifications, those criticisms can and they will be applied to his own classifications. Uh, and I think the the main person who he, I guess, seeks out to discredit is Joseph Greenberg. And Joseph Greenberg is probably the most famous African linguist, uh, just because he uh, just just because of his 
1963 work. Um, I think it's 1963. I can't remember off the top. But yeah, he um, reclassified a lot of African languages, but he did it based on previous work and his own new method called the mass comparison. Um, as of today, Niger Congo and Afro-Asiatic is probably the most accepted language family among academia. Uh, Khoisan is highly disputed. Nala Saharan is somewhat disputed. But the, the main two is Niger Congo and Afro-Asiatic. Mel, I, I think you wanted to add something to this. Uh, yes. Um, so you were right. He He spends the majority of chapter two of critiquing uh, Greenberg uh, and he also critiques the different language families. He did forget one of them, uh, Niger Qaddafian uh, and the uh, Nala Sahara and he, he also critiques those as well uh, and he goes into why they are flawed. Uh, he also details um, some people who uh, would used ethnic uh, varieties to to discredit Greenberg and uh, it's really just uh, him expressing why he disagrees with the term Afroasiatic as well as why he disagrees with, with Greenberg's work. Um, in that you see a little bit of bias because he talks about how um, because there hasn't been an African uh, linguist to do the work uh, that the work should be questionable um, based upon the ethnic background of the, the researcher. But uh, we know when it comes to science, you know, the, the ethnic background doesn't necessarily play a role. Um, it's just more so of the information. Uh, but you'll see in chapter two, as you read chapter two, that uh, he does Spe specify the different language families that are currently agreed upon as consensus, and he does critique them. Um, uh -oh. That's all I really had to say for chapter two. Yeah, oh, now, now you, you said something interesting. You said he shows a little bias. Is that what you said? I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be uh, politically correct. Yes, he does show some bias, um, but again, you'll see this throughout the other chapters and also through the work. Uh, so while chapter two does show some some bias, uh, it's prevalent throughout the entire book. Uh, but you'll you'll see that. Yeah, uh, a little bias is. I think that's that that's an understatement. I think you <laughs> give him a little too much credit. Like, but I mean, in my opinion, like the bias is just overwhelming. But again, we, we'll 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 get into all that. But like his bias is. Is, is the, the major downfall, one of the major downfalls of, of this work. All right, so yeah, we're gonna speak this up real quick. Chapter three discusses the application of the comparative method and it's indisputable results when rig rigorously applied. Um, chapter three states that his goal is to reveal the old state of Negro Egyptian. Um, yeah, uh, and he, he he lists some bullet points mm -hmm. um, that there at present is no general uh, classification or well, genetic classification of African languages. Uh, I, and I, I don't know where he's getting that from. There is a general, general classification of African languages, whether it's disputed or not, that's a different story. Um, number two, um, he excludes Semitic, Berber, and Khoisan. Um, and it, you, you'll see why, again, which is a common thing among these Afrocentric uh, linguists, is the tendency to exclude Semitic and Berber away from uh, what out of Afro-Asiatic. Uh, and what else? Uh, let me see. He tries to reconstruct. Well, he he attempts to reconstruct their proto language. Um, and number five, he seeks to demonstrate the kinship and the reconstruction of Negro Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, bro. 
Yeah, something I wanted to add. Just if you read chapter three, chapter three is primarily about him explaining the comparative method. Uh, so when he explains the comparative method and how it's to be used with African languages, he really has uh, three different causes that would help with the comparison. Uh, one, that there would need to be a random similarity between uh, the two languages, meaning it would be purely coincidence uh, that they share some similarities between those two languages. Uh, the other way would be uh, loan words. Uh, so basically, uh, one uh, term or one phrase would be borrowed uh, in another language that has a different background, uh, maybe even a different ge geographical location. Uh, but they may borrow words from others, whether, you know, there's uh, influence socially or maybe they're in war, uh, different factors that would cause that. But that's one. And then, of course, the last one is this genetic heritage that he spoke about in bullet point one. And basically, he's saying that two languages could share the same ancestor. And because they share that same ancestor, uh, it would show that the language would be originally ancient and uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to be credited with uh, borrowing because it was an inherited language, not necessarily a language that was influenced. Those are really the three ways he lists uh, in chapter three as far as how to uh, use the comparative method and employ it. Uh, so I just wanted to make that known in chapter three, what his uh, premise there is. Cool. Well put. Um, if I remember, I, I think we'll get to that later. But yeah, you made some good points. We'll touch on that later. Um, mm -hmm. Chapter four, languages of the comparison. Okay, uh, chapter four, he discusses the six languages individually. Um, he goes over the phonetics, the vowels, um, the transcription of the of the, the phonemes, and its reconstruction. Um, uh, one of the main highlights in that chapter is he denies that the single is an African-based Creole. Yep. So that, that's that's what I took from that chapter. So, also, uh, to yeah. add to that. Um, his primary argument with, with Coptic, even though Coptic is uh, biologically uh, part of the Egyptian language, even though uh, there is a religious background, they, they are, if it's an Egyptian language, it, it, it is you know, genetically connected. Um, his disagreement with the Coptic language and, and why it's not necessarily African is because it's not 100% Egyptian, it's not 100% uh, African. It has a mixture, of course, and because of that, and because of uh, his description of their phonetics, uh, he tries to argue why this language should not be considered uh, an African language. Again, this is part of their premise back in chapter two, where he's, he's saying, hey, I disagree with uh, for Asiatic. And so chapter four is basically starting to, to tear apart uh, you know, why he disagrees with it. Um, he does go through, like Joshua said, the, the, the vowel system, the consonants, the tones, and the syllables uh, for each of these languages. But uh, specifically with Coptic, you could tell again, it's just a little bit of bias. I'm, I'm just trying to be politically correct here, but <laughs> there is some bias there when it comes to that. Um, and that's really all I have to say about chapter four. Chapter four is very, very extensive because uh, when it comes to phonetics, you have to be very, very thorough. Uh, he isn't as thorough as one would expect, but he does show some of his work. So it's definitely something to not be looked over. All right. All right. So chapter five, chapter five is probably the crux of the whole entire framework of, mm -hmm. the, of, of the book, because mm -hmm. this is where he compares the six languages in this chapter right here. Um, 
we're, we're, we're going to get into all that. But uh, as you can see, this is from chapter five. Um, uh, it, it, it's he oversells his 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 uh, his premise. He oversells his conclusions, his results, and it, it'll come back to 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 like, like really haunt him. Like when you use such absolute language or verbiage, uh, use words like impossible. Uh, what else? Impossible, indisputable, et cetera, et cetera. Like he does with with his work, you you'll see that um that it's a major flaw within the whole entire framework. But but yeah, uh, chapter five is where he compares the six languages and comes up with proto Negro Egyptian. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, all right, so chapter six, seven, and eight. Chapter six, he deals with the mor morphology of the six languages. Chapter seven, he deals with the lexical correspondences. And chapter eight, <sighs> chapter eight, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> these three chapters to me are throwaway chapters. I'm just saying that. And you'll see why I'm saying that. Because if chapter five, his reconstruction is flawed, the rest, I'm not concluding that the, the rest of it will be flawed, but it's a pretty good chance that the rest of it is flawed. But yeah, chapter eight, he deals with the morphology um, of the six languages from Proto-Negro Egyptian. Right. Um, chapter eight, he just, uh, it's like he randomly chose different African languages, regardless of where they from, uh, what language they speak, uh, geography, history, contact, he just threw a lot of quote unquote African languages and created like a super family of Negro Egyptian. Um, yeah, so you want to add on to something, bro? Or move? Yeah, I didn't want to just walk past the, the three chapters. I think if, if one thing you could take from chapter six uh, is that he, fo he tries to focus on there being a game in, in ancient you know, or an, an ancestor tongue that connects, you know, the different morphological, morphological correspondence. Uh, so with that chapter, uh, especially starting with the proto-language, and you know, that's definitely sketchy to begin with, uh, because, you know, when it comes to linguistics, we don't really touch too much of proto-languages because there's not enough evidence necessarily to, to explain uh, the connection. Uh, there may be bits and pieces, but you can't necessarily right. take it and run with it. So that's that's my my thoughts on chapter six and why it, it definitely could be flawed, just because it's an it's a an early jump at you know something that's not necessarily uh, agreed upon. Uh, chapter seven is really a reconstruction again of uh, the lexemes, and and I think when you're talking about a proto-language and having to reconstruct it, uh, instead of trying to match different languages with it that could be connected due to, you know, a particular sound correspondence, I think he would be better suited to try to find uh, languages that are connected outside of just uh, these these, these few chance correspondences. I think if he could find uh, a connection with them, maybe in the same region, or uh, maybe there was some influence somewhere that would explain the borrowing, I think he'd probably be a little bit more successful uh, with his proto-Negro Egyptian uh, matches. It's because he isn't doing that and he's picking languages that have no uh, geographical connection, they have no biological connection, and he's saying that, hey, we have two different sounds from these two different groups, and they sound similar. And it's because of that where you start drifting off into the pseudo-linguistics lane, because you're not using a legitimate match. You're using something that sounds similar, but the context is off. 
And that's a crucial thing when it comes to linguistics, especially with comparisons, because you can't just use one particular set of correspondences. You have to have several, literally thousands, before you can make an argument. Well put, bro. I, I just think, honestly, you just need to stick to whatever career he went to school for. That's that's my opinion. But we're gonna move on. <laughs> Chapter nine. All right. So chapter nine is somewhat important. Um, he deals with the problem of, of context between different, or well, I'm not even gonna say different languages, just Semitic and Indo-European. Mm -hmm. He deals with uh, he deals with Proto-Semitic, Proto-Indo-European, and of course, like I said, the, the overselling of his premise, the overselling of his method, the overselling of his results ends up in, in statements like the Negro Egyptians uh, in a roundabout way gave birth to Semites, gave yeah, birth yeah. to the language of you know, Europeans. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, his, his, his exact words are basically Negro Egyptian influenced Indo-European languages. <laughs> also, again, again, no connection whatsoever. No but he's saying that they were influenced. And uh, he takes it a step further and say that they are Creole languages yeah. from Negro Egyptian. But we'll see that <laughs> later on. But hey, he's free to say what he wants to say in his book. You know what I'm saying? Chapter 10, general conclusions. And of course, the overselling of his conclusions, which I'm not surprised by. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, just look at the first sentence. Like the initial aim of this work was very modest, <laughs> although a great importance for African linguistics. Um, I, that that's his that's his opinion. But uh, I, I I really think that um, he just made a lot of grandiose statements. Um, mm -hmm. the, the method that he used to back up his grandiose statements were just subpar. And very underwhelming. For anybody that knows even the basics of, of linguistics, um, there's no way you can read this book <laughs> and say, yeah, he proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt, like he says, but he he did the total opposite. Um, you can go ahead, bro. Like, yeah, I'm about yeah, something really quick I wanted to add. In chapter 10, uh, and again, he does show it in the future slides, but in chapter 10, he's still making the bold claims of being able to linguistically uh, show that you could compare an African language to an, an, a quote unquote, in his terms, Caucasian language to an American Indian languages. And he's saying you can do this without uh no no blowback to your your research there's no no you know there's no issues that you're gonna have with the comparisons because uh there's nothing that will prevent you from making that comparison and i think when you when you're going across regions like that and you're trying to find matches you need to find something that would connect them, quote unquote, a sister tongue, you need to find that, or at least explain how they use borrowing to at least make a connection. Uh, if there was war in one region, that would explain it because, you know, the dominant society would be the dominant society ling ling linguistically, and therefore they would influence their languages on the other, but that is not the case. Um, so. He ha he has you know made this claim and like I said in the few ch charts above uh, in, in the next few slides you you will see him try to to force those but there's no way he can prove that type of borrowing uh, and that's all I really want to say in chapter ten. All right. All right. The purpose of this book is to prove the non-validity of the current classifications of the African languages. Um, I, I think number five, um, well, excuse me, number six is probably the reason why he's writing this book is uh, prove once and for all the non-existence of Afro-Asiatic family. 
Um, and then the other things, uh, of course, is it's tied into the premise of the book, but I think number six is re the reason why he's so adamant about this Negro Egyptian family. Um, and, and again, you'll see um, his bias uh, against Afro Jack is just evident, self evident, once you read this book. Uh, revealing the pre dialectical ancestor, other uh, languages compared to the level of phonology and grammar, is lexicon explained from this, this ancestor, pre dialectical and in intermediate states. Um, yeah, and illustrate two or three African languages, how other African languages can insert in this set and be well defined, which he did in chapter eight. Chapter eight is bullet point number five is basically chapter eight. He just threw any language from Africa he wanted to know, and it was Negro Egyptian now. So if you want to add it on to something, bro, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next one. Nope, no, that's good. We just lay in the, the groundwork. All right, cool. So, all right, what to look for? We look for excessive semantics um you know i mean i'm pretty sure everybody know what semantics means um it's a, a play on a play on words in 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 the linguistic realm well the the comparative method excessive uh semantics as you will see is a no-no um comparing short forms or monosyllabic roots um Basically, words with one consonant, one vowel is is a major flaw, or can be a major flaw, shall I say? Um, er erroneous morphological analysis, misidentifying sections of words, not not identifying prefixes, suffixes, um, things of that nature. Using absolute language, overconfidence in results, mitigating the work of previous. Um, a previous work or previous scholars and misrepresenting opposing theories that those are just some things to name a few um of, of the the flaws in this work and the two references that we use throughout this presentation is from from Trask's Trask uh historical linguistics and historical linguistics by Lyle Campbell so okay so this is who I guess who are like his main opponents besides Greenberg, you have Oral and Stobova. Well, uh, yeah, Oral and uh, Vladimir Oral and Stobova. They are Russian linguists that did a reconstruction in 1995, and at the same in that same year, uh, you have Christopher Eric, who also did a reconstruction independently from um, the Russian linguists. And they came up with their own two conclusions with uh, proto Afroasiatic. Um, they differed in a lot. They were um, they were on the same page and some stuff. Um, so, and on the right, you got uh, John Claude and Bowler. So we, we're going to see at the end how did he. How did he uh, stack up against these previous works? All right, so this chart is basically him construct, reconstructing those six languages, um, like the first row, P in Middle Egyptian, P in Coptic, the labial vela sound in Sango, in Zande, Elfin, Hauser, B in Somali. Um, he combined that and came up with a proto Negro Egyptian phoneme. Um, and he did that with a number of sounds. And this is the chart that he came up with. So this is the reference point um, whenever he makes a proposal of a proto word, a sound change here, or what have you. This is the reference word. If if he proposes a sound change and it doesn't really abide by this chart, that means that uh, there's an error somewhere. Mm -hmm. So just to put it lightly, if you want to ask one, bro, I'm move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just really quickly, um, in this chart and also in the other charts, you'll see that 
a lot of his uh, comparisons uh, in his phone, his number of phone names is quite vast. Um, whenever you do comparative uh, linguistics, you want to keep the amount of phonemes uh, as small as possible because you're trying to show similarities. So when you're when you're trying to show similarities, there shouldn't be a vast amount of differences within sounds. And I think that's something just to focus on, not only with this chart, as you can see, but also with other charts uh, as we move forward. All right, so now, this is the a color key and uh, a brief example of the, the, some of the graphs that you will see. And um, the color, if you look at the, if you reference the color key, you, you got green is for semantics, red is for the incorrect word, yellow is for Afro, uh, well, probably the most established Afro-Asiatic cognates. Um, this uh, light blue is for a word that Mboli either didn't bother to look at or purposely overlooked. We can't really distinguish which one, so we just say, you know, Mboli omitted. And this uh, hot pink magenta color um, is a borrowed word. And um, you see the red box. Um, it, it, the red box basically is um, established cognates or proposed cognates with most likely Middle Egyptian words that, again, he didn't bother to tell the audience. <clears throat> so this is uh, a reference point. This is not going to be your last time seeing this. This. Uh, this color key and this uh, the, these uh, text box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just to be really quickly, that that that's a legend, so to speak, of uh, the future slide. So you you'll see them again, uh, and it's just so that way you can understand what's being represented and uh, how to identify it in the future slides. But that that really is just a legend, just so you can understand what's going on. All right. All right, so here we go. Lyle Campbell, Historical Linguistics. It's about bad semantics or excessive semantics. So th this is what we talked about earlier. Um, you can read most of it. But uh, if you're doing a reconstruction, if you, if you're, if you do a reconstruction and you have a, a word that means bird in one language and then and the next language in that same reconstruction, it means fish. Somewhere around the, down the line, you made a mistake. Um, and that's just how comparative linguists go. But as you will see with this work, um, his his semantic range or leeway is almost infinite. Like he can make a connection between this item, this 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 uh, concept, this animal with anything he wants because his semantic leeway is infinite. Um, if you want to add something to that, bro, I'm just going to move on. But yeah, semantics or excessive semantics is probably one of the major flaws in any comparative work when you're dealing with um, pseudo-linguistics. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can go ahead. Yeah, so all right. So bad semantics got you comparing stuff like dog, fish, a forest to a rose petal or an elephant to a wolf. You know what I'm saying? And you'll see examples of this later on. Before you go past that, um, we'll start with the dogfish. Um, in the way, an example, so to speak, of uh, the bad semantics would be like expressing an, like an animal. You would say an animal. And then because there is no prefix or suffix or affix, uh, there's not enough information to describe uh, the differences. And so both of these are animals, but they very much differ. And the same thing with the color red and the forest, while you may find 
uh, some red in the forest, they're two completely different things. Uh, same thing with the elephant and the fox. Uh, they may be considered animals, but again, specifically, they are completely different. And that's what Josh is trying to explain is that, you know, when you're using excessive semantics, you're going to find very small similarities, but they do not specify. And this is why you want to use as, as the least amount as possible just to show consistency. That's all. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure in any language you can find a word that begins with a D in one language and for, for I guess, a dog, excuse me, a dog, of course. And then you can find a word um, that pertains to a fish in another language. And mm -hmm. if you just base that off the first two letters or the first letter in each word, I mean, mm -hmm. boom, you can come up with a protophony, which is basically what he's done throughout this work. Yeah. All right. All right, so bad semantics. Now, this graph you have on the left side, the stream left, you got the page number of where these words are re well reconstructed at in chapter five. And at the top, you see the languages Middle Egyptian, Coptic, Sango, Zande, Hausa, Somali. Um, example of bad semantics would be. Uh, the first one you got a middle Egyptian, you got the word for city. Sango is that of, Zande is person, Somali is person, and Hauja is person from. I mean, those, <clears throat> even uh, okay, so with Somali, that, that's uh, a pronoun, has nothing to do with uh, middle Egyptian uh, city. And even the, the Zande and Sango, like that of and Sango, like, I mean, it has nothing to do with city. I, it's just excessive semantics. You, you got 248, page 248, you got heart. In Middle Egyptian, you got red and Zande. Um, and Hauja, you got Gaba for in front. And he left off Somali, which is actually cognate through lowland eastern Cushitic and greater Cushitic to Egyptian. Um, at the bottom, the very bottom, you got the Duwat, which is the, the Netherland or uh, the, the, the world beyond the horizon to the ancient Egyptians. Um, but he compares it with uh, Duku, a hole in, in Zande. So these are examples of excessive semantics. Yep, same thing uh, with the uh, the Middle Middle Egyptian for Mr. Blood, and you know, in Coptic it's it's red, uh, and uh, Sango it's Sang, and then in Hausa and Somali it's sperm. You know, there there may be a connection there, maybe with the color or uh, you know what can be done in their region, but. Neither of those are messed of blood. Neither of those describe it. So yeah, you're correct. This is really just I, I would call that reaching, in my opinion, just because you're trying to to find similarities, but they're not quite similar. All right, well, well check this out. Check out uh the word for harp in Middle Egyptian on page two twenty four. Mm -hmm. Um he compares that with Jocelyn in Shango. Um, dance in Zande, which they, they could be cognate. I mean, Correct. Correct. they're spoken in the same exact area. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Hauja is shaking and Somali is dance. Okay, so we're dealing with harp. That's trance. I'm sorry, trance. Oh, excuse, excuse me, trance, trance. Yeah. So, I mean, you can see like the, the, the what you call the region or the bad semantics, what we call it. Mm -hmm. Um also in stone, you got stone in Middle Egyptian, you got be heavy. I mean anything can be heavy. A tree is heavy, uh, right. a large animal is heavy. Um so I mean just bad, bad semantics. Mm -hmm. All right. Um all right, so okay, so you know, throughout the book, I'm well throughout this presentation, I'm I'm going to show evidence of sound change 
from previous work, which he really doesn't try to go into, or he really doesn't really um, mention previous work. He does mention Greenberg. He mentions Eric, uh, Cohen, Hayward. Uh, but like you have Lipinski, you have Gabar Takax, and a couple other scholars that he fails to mention. They have they have work. They have work that's uh more up to date. Um, so this chart, I mean, you you can see this chart. You can reference it later on. But this is showing the, the sound change between this Egyptian, this Egyptian sound with continents from various branches in uh, Afro-Asiatic. Mm -hmm. Whether you got burn at the top with uh, Afro-Asiatic continents, you got a uh, leaf, head, um, young man, body, throat, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, there you go. So pretty much matching on the opposite side. Uh, the ones that don't necessarily match, they probably would have a cognate, but they're not as specific, so to speak. Um, but yeah, they, they are matching. Yeah, but this is in Bowles reconstruction with this same Egyptian uh, phoneme. Uh, it comes from the, the Nero Egyptian uh, I don't know what exactly he calls that, but this is what he says it comes from. And this is his evidence for those sound changes. Again, mm -hmm. you, you can see you can see using this color key, this legend. Um, he used excessive semantics to be fresh with cold um Jehuti, which is a proper name, with Moon and Shango and Zande. And um, this this Somali word, we'll get into that later, but it comes from a different source. Um, this this uh, word for house in Somali is also a bar word. Like so, basically, if you look at this this color key, it'll tell you the the problems with these reconstructions. And then also, you look at the text box; they have other Afroasiatic cognates. You know what I'm saying? Give the audience a, a chance to, to look at that, study it. You got the references. Mm -hmm. Some of the references, most of the references will be at the end where you can go look at, look up all this stuff, you know, on your own. So inconsistencies. Um, if, okay, so if you propose a particular change in one language, um, you either have to show evidence of this particular change or explain why this change does not abide by your original uh, reconstruction. And a, an example of this would be these inconsistencies right here in his work. Um, just look at like the right side uh, at the very top. You got a word for heart. When he reconstructs it, re reconstructs the the word for heart in and what he calls Negro Egyptian. Look at Zande. Um, he uses two different words from the same root. Um, go down to the next one. You got the word for build. Same thing. Um, the very bottom. You see he plays semantics with arm and hold. Uh, uh, own and how's your, I mean, these are examples of him being inconsistent and not explaining these sound changes in between these languages. So, so basically these words on the right, um, in each, each, uh, in, in each graph, you see, I pulled it from different reconstructions within chapter five. On one page, he'll say that heart, build, behind, nose comes from this source. And then later on in chapter five, it comes from a different source. So that's just inconsistencies that he fails to acknowledge, mention, or explain. So. Again, um, 
more, this is more semantics, bad um, linguistics. Uh, even at the bottom right here, you got the causative, the causative S. He compares it with to pose and, and to grab and single and zande. And um, you see right here, that's a common Afro-Asiatic Afro feature. And here's my source right here, you can look it up. But again, you can see in these charts, Bad semantics, incorrect words, um, omitted words like in in Hausa, um, the word for he put go down as the word for Hausa in um, I think that's Saku, but the actual word was descend. So moving right along. Um, all right, so now we're going into why previous linguistic classifications should be considered. All right, so so does Hausa does Hausa come from Negro Egyptian or does it come from Afroasiatic, uh, Chadic, West Chadic, Hausa? Um, I put this in here just just to give people an example of how words change, languages change, like the word for apple. Um, the word for apple went through a lot of changes, like in <clears throat> in Germanic, it went through um certain sound changes that change from words like a full up full to what we call today an apple and that ultimately descended from proto in the european hibol or you go down the tooth um uh, in older english um that uh the word for tooth actually had an end um after the 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 O sound, and with modern English, what we speak today, uh, we lost that that nasal sound, that that N sound. So mm -hmm. we pronounce it as tooth. So that's very important to, to discuss the the evolution of these words. All right. So okay. So again, the origin of African languages also uses household words that are clearly borrowed from various languages. All right, so oh, I didn't include the page numbers, but in the charts later on, you'll see the page numbers. But you see the word for, for, for wood comes from a not also hybrid language. The word for vagina comes from Arabic language. It's just going down to the word for victory goes, comes from Arabic language. The word for boil comes from a, a Berber to our uh, language. And the word for meat comes from the Congo. If you look at the right side, you see in Bolus commentary on Greenberg, he says for the word animal, uh, that in Boli just deliberately ignores the Hausa Nama. And see in Boli not considering previous classifications and history and contact, he doesn't know that that Nama and Hausa is a borrowed word from Bindu Congo for me. And he says right here, what is more serious is in the method, it is the absence of a procedure to eliminate the borrowing that Greenberg is not aware that they are extremely numerous in the African languages. Wow. So this is an indictment against Greenberg, according to Mboli, but he turns around and does the same exact thing himself. Yeah, he do, he'll do it again too. You, you see this again. Plenty, plenty, yeah. Like so, of course. So, so to the very left of the screen, you see highlighted is Proto Negro Egyptian R gave rise to Hausa R, but in academia, with these examples right here, that this this L actually came from. I mean, excuse me. This, this R actually came from an L. And you see right here, Hauser underwent a lateral uh, rotorization, producing the attested uh, Raumi. Other examples of the rule are Hauser Yaro, Proto Chatted Wulo, Hauser Siri, Takeaway from Kanakuri, Tole, et cetera, et cetera. So this evidence shows that the Hauser R 
came from a Chadwick and probably ultimately Afro-Asia at the L. But mm-hmm. in, in Boli, he says it comes from, from an R. Not only that, you, you see wow. the yeah, you see the development of the change as well, because you know, still it, it's still keeping you know, context, even though uh, it has developed its different changes, it still keeps context. Uh, that's dope that you know, you're able to see the growth, so to speak, or the evolution of the, the times. I mean, okay, so I mean, it's clearly right here on display. Like they said, uh, demonstration beats conversation. So, I mean, it's right here. Uh, the, the This L, if you look at the right side in the corner, you see this L with its axis subsided. You see various uh, chatted languages, like the word for a company to break, to chase off. You see in these chatted languages, they have L. When they get to Hauser, it changes to R. So that's incorrect from uh, John Claude and Bowling. Again, here's this uh, here's this chart. You see where it come, where it's supposed to come from, but it's not the case. Yo, man, my TV just cut on by itself. That shit crazy. Yo, yo Mel, you, you gonna edit this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, the, he All should right. be able to edit. Yeah, should be fine. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that shit came on by itself and was loud as hell. I don't know why. <laughs> That's crazy. But, uh, all right. Let me. All right, anyway, um, right here, next slide, you see. Um, he tries to explain the retroflex R in Hauser and where it comes from. But uh, if you look at examples, uh, you look at examples of this retroflex R and this, these other R's in, in Hauser, they either come from long words or a, a sound change from a dental, which is like a T, a D, any type of sound that's produced by your your teeth making a sound that involves your teeth is called a dental. So if in Hauser, that changed into what they call an R. And he, here are the sources right here on the right side at the bottom. You're looking mm-hmm. up yourself. So just don't take my word for it. Okay. When he says that the teeth making the teeth making a sound, he's He's speaking of the, the interaction with your, your tongue um, when you're using uh, your tongue and, and your teeth to make certain uh, sounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's part yeah. of you know, phonology. When you take the time to take a look at it, you really see how vast sounds are and sound changes are. But that, that's what he was talking about. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Um, going on to the next one. So, okay. Uh, see right here, in Boli reconstructs Proto-Negro Egyptian um, to house uh, this little glottal sound right here. Mm-hmm. And um, you see right here, I'm not, okay, so you, you'll see what's crazy about this, but it says in old house, neither this phoneme or that phoneme existed. Um, to the very right, you see, it is unlikely that a glottal stop it was in proto Afroasiatic, excuse, excuse me, proto Chadic uh, phoneme inventory. Um, later on down, you see in Hauser, virtually all medial stops, glottal stops are from long words. Now, what's crazy about where I got this from, I got it from the same exact source that he uses. Which is Paul hey. Newman. Yep. <laughs> yep. How's your language encyclopedia? So you're using the same, we were both using the same source. You use the same source and you come up to the conclusion that this comes from Proto Negro Egyptian. But I, when I look at the source, it comes from Proto Chadic. And then on top of that, the word 
what th these phonemes them themselves develop within housing. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't go back to proto Negro Egyptian. And this is from your very same source. And you can look at this source right here. Um, again, Paul Newman and the housing language and the encyclopedia reference for grammar. So, so he just ignored that? Of course. It's called, it's called cherry picking. You that, know what I'm saying? That, yeah, that shows that bias against the Afro-Asiatic, like you said. <laughs> of course. Wow. Of course. All right. So, again, okay, so another lesson is called erroneous morphological analysis. We, we touched on this very, very briefly mm -hmm. before. Uh, if you look at the house word for full, um, this Sika is actually, well, Sika should be the correct term for housing, meaning full. The A in Asike is not part of the root. A is a housing preposition. But at the top, he, he um, lists this as a proto phoneme, and it's actually just a preposition that developed in housing. Again, it comes from, it, it, see at the very bottom, it comes from the very, the very same source that he uses, the, the Paul Newman. language, uh, the encyclopedia reference for grammar, Paul Newman. All right, so a great number of the Hauser terms proposed by and boldly come from different roots. You know what I'm saying? Um, come right here. So I, I just isolated Negro Egyptian, well, excuse me, Egyptian, with Hauser and see that they come from two different roots with these words themselves. Cause this is, Egyptian is, is who he's trying to ultimately connect these, these words to. Correct. So if you see right here, these charts and these arrows, they'll show you where these words come from and they have nothing to do with each other largely. So in, in scholarship, um, if you're going to, call yourself going into a field, you you would have to at least be well versed in the previous work or a, at least acknowledge the previous work. But uh, what he's done so far is just not even acknowledge what what existed before his uh, reconstructions in 2010. Um, I don't know, I, that, that's either an indictment on his methodology or maybe his bias, I don't know. But you'll see this on the rest of the, the presentation. So nobody wanna add on, moving on. Here are, the, again, here are the sources for housing. Mm -hmm. All right, so Somali, Somali is another one. Um, so Somali comes from the lowland Eastern Cushitic language family or subgroup. Um, and either uh, it comes from the Omotana subgroup of uh, Lowland Eastern Cushitic. And it comes from the Proto-Sam subgroup of Omotana. And it's, co it's, uh, it's, it's cousins, close cousins are Rendio and other um, Omotana languages. So, but according to Mboli, Somali or Somalians themselves come from Proto-Negro Egyptian. And we'll see why this is an error right here. Mm -hmm. Negro Egyptian and Somali. So Mboli presents several words that have well-attested origins. If you look at this chart and compare uh, these sources versus his, like you got the word for moon. If you look at uh, the word for moon, uh, it descends from Eastern Cushitic that went through a sound change of Bil in Proto Somali that turned to Zahaya, uh, or the, the uh, Zahai, Zahaya in Somali, and that changed to the Yak in, in present day Somali. So it went through a sound change, but if you look to the left, and Bali compares it with Jehuti and Inze and Diwe and Zande. But it clearly has a different origin. Mm -hmm. Look at the word for egg. 
Okay, if you look at that chart, what does it say the word for egg comes from? Does it come from Negro or Egyptian or it comes from Arabic? If you look at the sources, that word for egg comes from Arabic. So again, that, that's that's in Boli ignoring um, borrowing. And um, so another term that he overlooks is the term for neck. Before you go to that, just because it's not necessarily there, but if you look up the translation, uh, the Arabic translation for egg, or just look up the Arabic translation for beta, or beta it is uh, explaining that it is an egg. Uh, just so for those of you who, who wonder why the word egg is not necessarily there, it's the translation of the Arabic word. I just wanted to add to that. Uh, it, it's there. You, they, they can look it up. I don't have nothing to hide. Like, it's, it's, it's there. Um, go down to what was I on? I was on, uh, yeah, the word for neck is core in Somali. He compared that with Negro Egyptian, but the word core comes from lakum in Proto Somali. So, attempting to reconstruct proto forms using late or borrowed words instead of older words is a methodological flaw within the time framework of Ebola's work. So here's this chart. Here's the references at the bottom. You can look them up yourself. And this is another case where I think he ignored the borrowing there. Um, he doesn't include much Arabic in the text. So is this like a pride thing? Sorry to cut you off, but is it like a pride, a pride <laughs> issue? Like you, no you, have, you have to ignore the Arabic. You have to ignore these Afroasiatic borrowings. Which I mean, you you can't deny that borrowings happen. So I mean, how do how do you explain that away if you're that's that team? If, if you remember earlier, he did explain he did express that he had to eliminate borrowing uh, with Greenberg's work. Uh, so he, he's initially attempting to do that. Um, whether there's uh, some pride, I, again, I don't know. I can't speak for that. Uh, but you can see that, again, it's, it's clear that there were, there were some borrowing there. And I think to not at least look at the work and acknowledge it, you may disagree with it, but at least to not necessarily acknowledge it does kind of show that there may be some bias there. Yeah. So wait, Tria. So you say pride? Would, would you say? Would you call it ethnic pride? <laughs> would, you, would you call it that? It's it's pseudo ethnic, <laughs> pseudo ethnic pride. I would say because because we can't really speak for these Negro Egyptians because we're not really them either. So we can't really say that that's our ethnicity if we're that team. So it's like a well, pseudo. I, I would say pride. Negro Egyptians are not even Negro Egyptians, but go ahead, bro. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hey, 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 hey this, hey, this, uh, this Geechee. I say it's uh, the, the ideology of the Negro Tube movement. Oh, it's a oh, French man. Afrocentric movement. <laughs> there, there we go. See, that's oh, what I'm man. saying. Pseudo ethnic pride. Pseudo ethnic pride. Yeah. Triz, I'm glad you said that, bro, because toward the end of this uh, presentation, that's exactly the case. Like, you, you'll see later on, but I mean, the exact words you said <laughs> is exactly why he did this. And it, this comes from his, his own mouth. Like, Yeah, yeah, that's the crazy part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he actually mm -hmm. typed those words. Yeah, it's crazy. So, again, um, you got to the left in Bowley's reconstruction. Of uh, this Somali sound, this J. Um, but this this Somali this Somali sound that Boli says comes from Negro Egyptian actually comes from a lowland East constricted uh, ejective sound, and you can see the cognates right here. Um, even down to at the very bottom is the word for ear. Um, that also comes from. Proto uh, Eastern Cushitic. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at all of this, all this uh, evidence, just just by Hausa and Somali alone, I could have went further. I st I still am going to go further, but just by these very basic examples, you can see that clearly Somali and Hausa has 
an ancestry before quote unquote Negro Egyptian. Right. And not not just that they have an ancestry, but you literally could walk backwards with the language and see where it comes from and how it develops. It's almost as if you know the, the language evolved over time. Right. You can see that. It, it's not necessarily something you can see crystal clear when it comes to Negro Egyptian because it's just step A or step B. There, there's no gradual development. When yeah. It comes to, yeah. So you can you can see the connection uh, when you're talking about uh, you know, the Afro-Asiatic agreement on those languages versus uh, the Negro Egyptian. Correct. I follow. All right. So, all right. So, so Sango, okay. Sango clearly has a picked in origin. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like it, it emerged because of a combination of a lot of the Ubangian people along the Ubangi River in Central Africa converged on each other, trading. And they needed a common language. They developed this this pigment language. Oh, and, and with, with conjunction to the scramble for Africa, if you remember the scramble for Africa, you remember that Europeans, mainly the Bel the uh, the Belgium Empire and the French Empire, um, invaded Central Africa in particular. And when they did so, they needed what well, they recruited a lot of workers from South Africa. Eastern Africa, Western Africa, and with these workers coming in speaking African languages, the Europeans use these uh, these foreign Africans from foreign African countries to communicate with the the native Africans in Central Africa. So they develop this 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 Creole language, what is pidgin first, and then develop into a Creole language. And they call it Sango. Um, but, you know, Mboli does not really acknowledge prior history. He doesn't acknowledge prior relationships, context, what have you. And, and you see at the, at the bottom, you see that he just, he says that, that some linguists like William Samarin have tried without success to make a uh, sang uh, vehicular Sango a Creole-based let's go, uh, well, embodying let's go uh, Creole. Uh, he says, we will not dwell on these risky hypotheses, firmly bellied by the facts and long refuted by Dr. M. Uh, Diki Kidiri, a single speaker, a, a single speaker and specialist of this language. All right, so, so Dr. Diki Kidiri, does disagree with Sango. It's not a in body based pigment. He does agree with that. But what in both fails to mention is that, you know, this this same gentleman says that Sango does indefinitely um uh, well, excuse me, definitely comes from an embody language. So he doesn't say anything about a Negro Egyptian as the origin of Sango. And Looking, okay, we, we're going to look at what, what William Samory said about this uh, Kadiri fellow. Um, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, can, I can look at that. Uh, Samory basically says, in opposition to my reconstruction of the origin of the Sango language uh, and the language of Central African Republic, uh, he criticized uh, uh, Dickie Kadiri. Uh, as mythic and motivated by ideology and not necessarily grounded on the historic and linguistic facts. Uh, Samarin <clears throat> argues that Sango emerged because of prisonization of the Mbangi dialects at the very beginning of the colonization of that region. Uh, Diki Kadiri says that it's evolved from Dindi uh, which is already a vehicular language that existed when the Europeans arrived. Uh, Samara is saying that Dickie Kadiri's arguments are submitted to analysis and contradiction by thorough documentation, which has yet to be uh, prevented. 
also um something i wanted to add here just to have like a backstory um sango uh was used more so when the french army uh came to central africa like joshua was saying they had to recruit them because uh it was commonly used at the time widely used uh at the time as a major language in their region uh not only did the army use them but also missionaries in that region also were using tango so again you know, just to further solidify that uh tango is a pigeon and you know that it was you no know, borrow it was it was a primary language at the time but it also had some borrowing based off of influences and, and over time that's how they developed yeah, I, I would say i would say in the belgium the belgium you know they spoke french as well too hmm. Uh, Jasper, if you're there, you can go to the next slide. My bad, I had to step away for a minute. But uh, mm -hmm. kind of missed what y'all said, but uh, I'm pretty sure y'all went over yeah, yeah. the burn of, you know, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, going on with uh, William... Samarin, um, William Samarin, and uh, analysis of Pitt and Sango um, went and did a comparison of Nbangi and and Sango, and did a, a comparison. And of course, I mean, most of the words now. Some of the words come from Katabu, Lingala. Uh, there was some Siri Siri words, some Wolof words, uh, Swahili words, because of the French and Belgian uh, empires recruiting all these Africans. But the majority of the of the of the of the words in Sango came from in Bangi, in Bandi, excuse me. Um, and he, or well, William Samory, came up with a list right here. As you can see, and and these very same words you'll see later on in this in this uh, presentation dealing with yep. Sango. Yep, which is crazy. So I'm okay. We'll touch on it later, but I want to talk about it somewhat right now. If you say that a mother tongue, talking about our mother, a mother gave birth to these six languages, that means that these six languages emanated from this one mother tongue they shared. And when you talk about Sango, Somali, Hausa, these three in particular had a very distinct origin and it wasn't a Negro Egyptian. Somali clearly comes from a Omotana, lowland Eastern Cushitic language, which we'll get into later on. Sango clearly had a prior ancestry before Negro Egyptian. But according to Mboli, Sango came out of his mother and became Sango and migrated to the Central African Republic. So, but you'll see later on how, you know, that's uh, clearly flawed, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. All right. So now we're dealing with labial dealers. And these sounds, <laughs> are extremely rare when you talk about the world's languages. Um, I think some East Asian languages contain some labial velars and the rest of them, the rest of them are found only in the Western Sudanic region and Niger Congo region of, of uh, Africa. Other than that, that these, these, uh, these sounds which are very difficult to make if you're not, if you're not a native speaker. Um, these are, are restricted to these areas, and it just so happens that these 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 sounds are restricted to like West Africa, mm -hmm. um, West Sudanic, Central Africa, from from the postulated 
home of Naja Congo. So right here, we finally noticed that when the vowel enters the phonemes, uh, G and B disappears and Sango and Zande gives not the segment GB, but a sound unique, or a unique sound. So it's elucidated that one of the origins of this complex phoneme, which is only or mostly found in Sub-Saharan Africa. So according to Mboli, it's, it comes from Negro Egyptian, you know what I'm saying, of course. But we'll see later on that this, this sound does not come from Negro Egyptian. Right. Also, uh, to add on labial velars, uh, depending on whether it's a consonant or, or it's nasal, um, you could you know with with West Africans, a lot of their uh, a lot of their sounds are are using the roots of the mouth, um, and that's something that is mostly specific to that area. Uh, you also see it in Central Africa and also uh, something I was looking up is that it's also a little bit common in uh, New Guinea area uh, where they also share those uh, similar similarities with uh, those dwellers. Um, so something I wanted to add there. Just as, you know, how, you know, the sounds are actually produced. Right. Um. Now, uh, the, 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 the point of where these sounds originate at is for one or two things. One, they're genetically related mm -hmm. in Africa, or it's a linguistic area, meaning that it's an area effect from contact between people and people, language and language, that these sounds sound similar. But as you can see right here, um, it says that these labial velars are widespread in Niger Congo. Um, they are absent from Afroasiatic, Khoisan, and are otherwise extremely rare in the world's languages. Uh, 848 languages in the world have a labial velar sound. 92% of the languages are African. 604 have both of these labial velars. 303 have only uh, two. Uh, well, well uh, KP and, and, and uh, GB as uh, labial velas and only 110 have just one or the other. But as we can see right here, these are the languages on Africa or in Africa that, that has these labial velas. And it's just coincidental that they all, all occur to where Niger Congo supposedly originated at. Mm -hmm. Now, Bantu has labial velas, but it, it came through a historical uh, renovate, uh, innovation, excuse me. So the innovation in Bantu languages around the Central Sudanic area in Central Africa came about because of, of a vowel in between a velar sound and developed to a labial velar. But majority of the labial velas in Africa are found in West African languages. Yep. And he has a sources for each of these uh, on the left hand side. All right, so having established that, like you have certain words that he's, he's tried to equate with uh, Egyptian words, Afro-Asiatic words. You can see right here, I have the Afro-Asian or Afro-Asiatic cognates in between the Zande, the Zande words. Cause, I, cause, Cause Sango, at this point, I'm just done with Sango. Like it's, it's is a pigmen slash Creole language, like I'm, but we're focusing more on Zande in contrast with Egyptian, mm -hmm. uh, Somali, and Hausa. So you can see where these sound changes in different languages related to Egyptian, where they occurred, and if you know the history of these labial velas coming from West Africa, they don't have anything to do with with uh with these Egyptian sounds. And here here's a list of some of the reconstructions. Yep. Here's all the some of his uh matches for the Velas. Definitely pause the screen and take a look at those. All right. So all right. So now on to the Afro Afro Asiatic side. Um 
They have emphatics and ejectives. Uh, numerous reconstructions of proto afro strongly suggest that the ancestral language to various branches of Afro-Asiatic possess a series of emphatic or ejective sounds, which underwent numerous changes in each branch. Um, you got the verbal pharyngeals. Um, you got the the chatic implosives, because the the emphatics and ejectives turn it into implosive um, in chatic. And in Egyptian, Egyptian retain the the cuss sound, which is cognate with Somali and uh, Cushitic uh, ejective sound, or well, emphatic sounds, and it's also cognate with Semitic cogn uh, uh, emphatic sounds. It was almost as if those two kind of kept that alive, so to speak. Say that again, bro. I said it's almost as if some uh, Semitic and Somali kept that sound alive. Um. No, what actually Semitic and Kushit it kept the sound alive, that sound okay. alive, alive, but also Chadic, it turned into implosives. So mm -hmm. that sound still exists in, in Chadic languages also. Yeah, it's, it's probably it's probably from the influence of uh Niger Congo and uh Nilo Saharan speakers. Oh no, no, the, well, not, not the implosives. Not the implosives. The implosives come from Afro-Asiatic. Now you have um, chatted languages do have some uh, some some nasal consonants like MB, which I'm saying in English, but MB sounds that that clearly comes from from now Chicago, which is because chatted speakers have a, a Nala Saharan slash now Chicago background, but it was the the uh, if you look at the migration patterns, the Chadic speakers that came upon the, the, the Lake Chad region, um, they really um, assimilated a lot of the population that was there and took over. But we, you know, but you know, again, we'll get into that later on. All right, so next is monosyllabic roots or monosyllabic words in the comparative method. Monosyllabic sounds exactly like it sounds. Monosyllabic, just one syllable whether it be a consonant, vowel, a vowel consonant, or just a vowel. Um, and um, it says, well, in Boley says, the real matches are those who will now be established. We'll begin first with the correspondence formulas referring to the, the, the monosyllabic type stru structures or whatever. But it goes without saying that it is on the consonants, particularly those in initial position, that the effort should should be first, which is a mistranslation. But basically, he's he's basing a lot of his reconstructions off of this. And mm -hmm. go to the next slide. Excuse me. So before you before you go there, I do want to give some examples of monosyllables. Um, so words like yes or no or uh, by or jump in heat. Those are all examples of, of monosyllables. <clears throat> well, I'm, uh, I, I have to wait for just a quick second, but an example of monosyllable words, I think you, I think you said like no. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Ka, no. Ka, yeah. Like it's basically, it has no, no consonant at the end of it. It's just basically uh, either a consonant and a vowel a vowel in the consonant, or mm -hmm. just a vowel by itself. And the reason why you dis, you uh, exclude these in um, reconstructions is because you can find a tu and a cu in any language right. at any given point. And then you combine that semantic leeway that Emboli and his peers like to do, you can make a connection between any language on the face of the earth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, so right here, it, it talks about the monosyllabic words composed of a single consonant and vowel may be true cognates, may be true cognates, but they are so short that their similarity to forms in other languages could also easily be due to chance. Likewise, if only one or two sounds longer, 
uh, of longer forms are matched, then the chance remains a strong candidate for explanation of the similarity. Such comparisons will not be persuasive. And, uh, the whole word must be accounted for. But whatever we, we do, we must not allow ourselves to be persuaded that a mere list of arbitrary or random or unsystematic resemblances, however long, cons constitutes bias of per persuasive evidence for anything. Um, and this comes from, from Lyle Campbell, uh, historical linguistics. They, uh, <clears throat> he basically goes over why we don't accept monosyllabic words because the, the chance of uh, these two languages just being randomly look alike languages or brother or sister languages is so high that you just avoid it all together. But if you go back, you see in Bali say, hey, the first thing we're going to do is look at the <laughs> monosyllabic roots. Like, <laughs> that's crazy to me. Like, that's yeah. crazy. And you'll see you, why, right? I want go you to go back to uh, the previous slide with Mr. Campbell. He has a quote there. I don't want to overlook it. Uh, at the bottom, he says, it's sad to report that a number of linguists have failed to grasp this elementary point and have, as a result, squandered their careers in collecting lists of resemblances among whichever languages have caught their eye. <laughs> he says, always with success, of course, uh, they have proudly announced their findings, quote unquote, and declared them to be evidence of an ancient link between the languages that they are looking at, and they are baffled and hurt when no one pays the slightest attention. <laughs> Woo! Man, what you talking like? So the the the, the key words in that is always with success. Always. Always. <laughs> Every single time. So that's kind of that's kind of like a cherry pick. Like it, it would be too easy. Just, Just too easy. easy. Whether it be Egyptian and Sumerian, Egyptian and Marauder, Egyptian and Bantu, Egyptian and Chiluba, Egyptian and and the Basque languages, Egyptian and whatever. Like if you look at just monosyllabic roots, you are going to find a connection. And the point of doing this comparative work is to eliminate any universal features of all languages. Right. So right here, you see all of this. Um, these are, I think the majority of him just comparing just one, <clears throat> one phoneme between the languages and some of that's cut off. But you can see right here, um, now, now the, the, the crazy part about this, now you see right here where he says that the real matches are those um, where we will begin first with the monosyllable roots and it's, they, they're more important. And right here, he actually agree, like he agrees with what Lyle Campbell says, like which is just contradictory. It's like I just don't understand it. Um, he, he, what he says about the Proto-Bantu and Ethic languages of Nigeria, he says, since the sighted matches are regular and often focus on two consonants, it could be, it could validly assume that it is a, the legacy of words of a common ancestor. So, uh, and Boley agrees with the, the methodology on the bottom. And he agrees with Lyle Campbell methodology well my Lyle Campbell's um uh words referring to the the monosyllabic comparisons how it's not reliable but that's <laughs> that's one of the basis of his whole entire work. Doesn't make any sense. Monosyllabic works. First thing we're gonna do and then he comes over here and agrees with what Lyle Campbell is saying about monosyllabic rules. It just doesn't make any sense at all. So on one hand, monosyllabic is not enough just to have one sound, and, and he's agreeing with that, but then he's going to commit in that same crime. Is that it, bro, <laughs> is that, that, almost in the same, bro, almost in the same sentence. Like, that's how crazy it is, like. 
this he, is weird. Yeah. This is for me, like as a layman coming in, like for all the people that's listening, that's a layman like me on this, I'm not a linguist, but common sense would, would tell you that you can't just use one sound because then that means that psychologically you're thinking that every single human on the earth means the same thing when they right. use the same sound. Correct. 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 My man. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> It's Valley Tree is right there, y'all. Valley Tree is right there. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy, bro. I'm not hey. even a linguist. I'm not even a linguist, but it's like, how 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 do you operate with that as um your premise that every single language, every single person, when somebody does the or when somebody does the that they mean the same exact thing. How how come they can't mean something different depending on where you're from? Man, uh, look, look, all right. We, we're not going to jump ahead of ourselves, but you are 100% on point. <laughs> when we cross that bridge, I'm going to refer back to Valley Trees. Yep. <laughs> I got you, bro, but you are 100% correct. All right, so, um, hold on. All right, moving on. So, okay, so the grammar and morphological comparison. Um, now this is like chapter six and seven. Uh -huh. He says with the establishment, what he calls the establishment of, oh, excuse me, um, establishment of phonetic correspondence in 26 languages. Um, he wants to demonstrate the grammar and the, and the, and the morphology between the six languages, I mean, as we've seen before, we touched on lightly thus far that these languages have a different um, history and ancestry than what he's postulating right here. But again, Mel, if you want to touch on anything before I move on, but we, we'll see later on that, that his assumption regarding the grammar and morphology is just, just in, in, in error. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's still sticking on the fact that he's proved uh, with the examples, you know, that we showed you. He's still showing that he's proved kinship. He's, he's shown the connection uh, with the mother tongue and those other six languages. And just by looking at the, the past three, we know that they come from another another connection. So there's no way possible that they came from Negro Egyptian. There's no way that Negro Egyptian is the mother tongue of those three languages when you can even see the evolution of some of them. So I, I just think that it, it's almost like uh, he's just either being ignorant or he's going to continue to cherry pick on what works for him. Um, but yeah, you, you'll see it's a little bit more coming up. Now, would you call that circular reasoning? Yes. Um, yes. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, moving right along. Okay, we're going to move along. Right. All right, so we got Egyptian and Zande. Because I'm not I'm not focused on Sango. Like, it's clearly like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick it and turn it to a Creole. You got it. Egyptian and Zande demonstratives. Like, this, that, there, the. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you compare it side by side, that's clearly not the same. Now, in, in this in this uh, chapter of morphological correspondences, of course, he tries to make a connection between the Egyptian demonstratives, where you can see right here, the audience can see they they just don't look the same at all. Uh, but what he what he did was what what we'll see later on. He violated one of his premises or his. Uh, his principles of the comparative method. He says that you do not compare a proto language or a proto reconstruction with a proto reconstruction. And he mm -hmm. does that, which he makes these demonstratives and other parts of or aspects of these, these languages appear to be cognate when they're really not. Because I can take any word, any phoneme, between any language and come up with a proto, uh, a proto phoneme, a proto sound, a proto language. I can do that. Anybody can do that. 
All you gotta do is put a little after system besides your reconstruction and boom, you have a proto reconstruction, but that proto reconstruction doesn't mean it actually existed. You have to test that against the, the languages that you use to determine whether or not your hypothesis is valid or not. And you got right here, uh, you got the pronouns. You got uh, first person singular, me, my. Uh, you got second person singular, you, your, um, so forth and so forth. If you just look at, you look at uh, Egyptian and Islamic side by side, and they, they appear to be, oh, you know what? The last three, the last three I didn't change. That's from something else, but we, we can change that. Oh yeah, the plural, yeah, we can change that. Yeah, we, we change that, because that, that's, that's, not, that's not what I meant to put right there. Okay. But yeah, yeah, we can change that. All right, so you got, uh, you got the, the plurals, the plurals between Egyptian and uh, Zande. Zande uses just a uh, regular old uh, ah sound. And it's when plurals is just not the same. You got interrogatives, who, what, when, where, how, which, why, et cetera, et cetera, is, is not the same, not even similar. And for, for the general audience uh, looking on, I, I didn't put the examples in here because it was just way too confusing. All you seen was an asterisk and asterisk in linguistics showing is basically showing that uh this is his reconstruction. Mm -hmm. for, for really no, no, really no evidence. Go ahead. No, just make sure you let them know when you put the asterisk, he's also saying that he's reconstructing a proto language, not necessarily just an active language. Exactly. And he did that all throughout chapter six and seven and eight. Um even the numbers, according to him, the numbers are cognate, but I mean, you look at first, second, third, or one, two, three, four in both languages, like they just don't, they don't even look the same. And, and I challenge anybody to look up Zonde numbers and try to count and order the numbers in Zonde. Count to 50, try it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead, bro. And I say, I'm gonna say this this Geechee. I'm gonna say we'll, we'll make it even worse. The the Zande, the Zande people is not even a, a ancient people. They they formulated in the eight in the in the nineteenth uh, century. They the, the the Bandia and the and the Bangora people. Uh huh. It, 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 but 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 if you ignore a, a people's prior history, I mean that's not a problem. You but you, you but you right though. Brother Gucci, but yeah. a, a crucial but, thing we were always coming up across when it came to doing this is timing, as far as like the time differences between these two languages. Uh, that was always something we came across, but apparently he's always ignored it, regardless. Um, and that that's fine if you're gonna ignore it, but show the evolution of it, you know. Yep. Show how it became what changed into, you know, which are currently trying to connect it with. Not just say, hey, here's the connection. All right. I mean, I mean, I mean that that's what I'm saying. Um, it's just crazy how they bang on said group, said whatever, because they, they, they ignore this part of science, ignore this part of history, and they turn around and do the exact same thing. Which is, which I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised by it, but I mean, it's it is what I, it is. I am, <laughs> I am. I mean, I, I mean, I expect it, so I'm not surprised. Like it'll be, it'll be surprising if it was unexpected. But at this point, I expect it. So I expect it. I expect a uh, a uh, revisionist theories, revisionist uh, hypotheses about history. I expect that at this point. So. All right, so one of the best examples of his uh, his morphological analysis is 
the the uh, the causative s, I guess we call it a suffix. He says that the that the uh, suffix in these body parts is of Negro Egyptian. He compares Zande at at uh, if you look at uh, as we have already indicated, Zande names of body parts have a su suffix s e or e. Um, he compares that with um, Egyptian series one and Hausa, and he includes again a Hausa um, word that that's of Arabic origin. So, what the the problem with this is that the Egyptian and, and Hausa words are not um, suffixes; they are actually part of the root. So why why is that important? Why is a distinction between part of the root and part of a suffix very important in, in linguistics? Is because you come to conclusions that the, that what you say is part of the word when it, when it's really not. So these X, well, excuse me, these S, uh, the S's in these examples are not suffixes; they're actually part of the root. And a suffix right here defined is an, an affix, whether it's beginning, in this case at the end, is attached to the end of a root or stem. So if you're dealing with a root or a stem, these, these words that he uses for Egyptian, for example, are also cognate in Hausa and other ch Chadic languages, and they are not suffixes at all. Right. And, and look at this chart to the right in the corner, you can see where these are not suffixes, these are part of the actual root. If you look at the Semitic languages and uh, for, for body compared with Egyptian, those are not um, suffixes. You look at the word for bone in Egyptian compared with Berber and Southern Somali uh, dialects, those are not suffixes. The, the word for side in Egyptian compared with Semitic and the word for tongue, which is a a very prevalent Afro-Asiatic cognate. So again, what we call that is an erroneous morphological analysis. And he does that throughout this book. But this is probably like the best example to exemplify that to the now audience. Is, is this something that could happen if maybe his translations were flawed? Because uh, it seems like if, if it's already a part of the root word, you wouldn't identify it as a suffix if it's part of the root. Like, it's basically trying to separate the word itself. But is it possible that maybe the translation is flawed and maybe because of that, he's mis misinterpreting the root words? No, no, it's, it's a combination of incompetence and not studying or ignoring prior evidence. It's a combination. It could be all three, it could be one of, of, of that, but it's not an excuse. We don't make excuses over here. Like, if you have time to write a 600 page book, you should at least have time to read a 40 page article dealing with <laughs> this particular subject, which there are pl plenty of articles dealing with um, Suffixes, affixes, prefixes. Fixes, yep. Yeah. You learn you learn that in school, to be honest. <laughs> uh, 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 but but if you went to school for electrical engineering instead of historical linguistics, I mean, I don't. I'm not surprised by you not understanding the field as a scholar, which is the the case in point right here. You know what I'm saying? But but not even college. You, you learn. Prefixes, suffixes, and affixes in high school, at least in in America, I would say. I mean, but th again, that, that's 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 the beauty of being a pseudo scholar. You you have no no rules. You can be as rogue as you please, <laughs> regardless of the scientific laws and facts that seven before you. Fuck, I was, excuse me. Get all that. But you know, you know what's funny though, guys. Not to interrupt, is that ahead, in, in, in being rogue, I'm noticing <clears throat> you can't help but to still use the the as a foundation prior research. Oh, but then, man. but then, but then you turn around and ignore it. You know what I'm saying? 
Like he didn't make, he didn't invent all of this stuff that he's um, going through and comparing. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it came from somewhere, but then at some point he decides to ignore and then go a different direction. But you already started by wrestling Basically. with these terms that was already created by other academics. Hey y'all, that, that, that's Brother Triz. Again, being very brief but profound because that is exactly <laughs> the case right here. Go ahead, man. I know you want to. No, no, I, just, I was just laughing because of how true that was. That's that, that's exactly that's exactly the case. Like it's it's crazy how said author said person in this field is just incorrect. But you look in the bibliography, said person in the field is in the bibliography. Like I, that's I don't understand that. How, <laughs> Like it, it is not, that doesn't make sense. Disagree. It, it's not even because you disagree. It's because you you kind of you extracted something from his book. Like that's crazy to make your argument. That is right. Amazing. Right. It's not like you came out of nowhere and just started blurting out. Okay, this is this this and that. that would make more sense if it was like truly rogue and it didn't have yeah. no no info, yeah. no prior info from other academics, and it was truly rogue, that would make more sense. And you would be like, okay, he's just trying to put it together without talking to anybody else. But he's going and consulting other people and then turning a blind eye and saying, no, nah, it actually go like this. <laughs> yeah, that's it, boy. You nail on the head right there. That's, that's crazy, man. It is. I, I think people that are too close to this kind of study they be having like a, a bias on it where like somebody like me, I'm a, I'm a layman on it. And so I, I got these different kind of eyes that I'm putting on it, this common sense that I'm putting on it. And it, it just totally blows my mind that, that he thinks this is correct. Um, if you, if you ready to see some of the Facebook, like I did, me and Mel and a couple of others, I'm not surprised at all because the way he repeatedly bolsters his views and his uh, premises and downplays his opponents, I'm just not surprised by this. Like, this is just a regular day at the office for a pseudo scholar, wherever, whatever field he's wow. in. Wow. I'm surprised because of how many times this work was recommended. I, I was expecting it to be, you know, a little bit more thorough, but uh, it, it just caught me off guard, to, to be honest. They have to read it. They, I mean, I'm not surprised by that either. Like, did you read that 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 other book we did? Like, I mean, did you read that? <laughs> <shit>? <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, all right. So, <laughs> moving on. <clears throat> Wolof. The genetic related, relatedness of this language has been demonstrated beyond any doubt, any possible doubt by Professor Sheikh Anta Diop. Again, it has been demonstrated beyond any possible doubt. Now, this is this infinite, uh, absolute language that we talk about that scholars typically stay away from mm -hmm. because in science, you have to be you, you, it has to be falsifiable, at least. We, we have to be able to test it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to be able to test this hypothesis. If you right. say that, demonstrate it beyond any possible doubt, um, I hope that you have such surmounting evidence that, okay, you know what? It's, this is a scientific fact right now. Right, but, like, were you, were you over there speaking to the well life people that maybe had a a well off speaker verify your fight. Like, you gotta have like primaries to make that claim. And I think over time, that's gonna be challenged. And I think that's where he's making a, a, a flaw. I don't think, I don't necessarily <laughs> think uh, Diop made such a bold claim. No, he didn't. He 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 alluded to some of his claims, but I, but I, I what I like about Dio is that you know, 
you know what I'm saying, what we went over, um, mm -hmm. he said that he wanted the generations to expound upon what he's saying. Correct. Fact check what he's saying. Correct. This is what this is what we say at first, Team Osiris. Yes. You can check it. You can check the timestamps, the date, and all that. We say it at first that Dio wanted us, well, wanted the newer generations with more scientific tools and resources to check what he's saying. And I, I respect that about him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But these these new ones, <laughs> oh man, what they're preaching right now is the gospel. And again, Ebola is of that same cloth of I preach the gospel. I'm absolute. What I say is law and don't question me. <clears throat> and again, like at it, right, the reader can check that the phonetic matches that emerge from this example are exactly the same and those that can be drawn from the examples cited. This genetic, genetic relatedness is indisputable. It's crazy. I mean, I think that's crazy because, I mean, if you look at it right there, like that's clearly disputable. Clearly. But we're going to move on from that. I'm not even going to touch on Wolof because we spent enough time on Wolof. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this part is the Swadesh list. What is a Swadesh list? A Swadesh list is a, uh, a list developed by more Swadesh comprised of a basic vocabulary that is universal and cultural, cultural uh, free. The Swadesh list helps the comparative linguist answer the most basic of questions when doing the comparative method. Are these languages related or not? Now, <clears throat> it, it, it now, it's not the defining uh, indication of genetic rela relationship, but it's one of the diagnostic avenues that you take between two languages. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, these two languages have to have history, some type of history together. You know what I'm saying? And you, what you do is you just put this basic list out there. Sometimes it's 100. Um, other lists are shorter, some lists are stronger or, or longer or whatever, but this is the Swadesh list right here. So the, the word meanings come from the, Swad the Zande Swadesh list and you receive from uh, archive.org, Rosetta, Rosetta Project. Egyptian word meanings come from uh, Antonio Lipriano, um, Ermin, Agrippo, and of course, uh, Faulkner. List. So, um, something I wanted to add about the Swadesh list, just to, to show the importance of it here. Uh, it's it's used when it comes to assessing the genealogical relatedness of languages, as well as even the dating of their divergence. Uh, so, just to kind of show the importance here, <clears throat> it's, it's something that is used uh, quite commonly when it comes to uh, looking at origins of languages. Right. Um, if anybody tells you that this is the end be all of, of uh, um, genetic relate relatedness, that they're lying. We're not saying that. We're just saying that this is part of the whole entire process. Right. So, right here, you got the words for I, you, we, this, that, who, what? Not all, many, one, two, big, long, small, woman, man. Um, you can see the first couple of examples. You can probably say, oh, you know, it looks similar, yeah. but the, the further you go along, mm -hmm. person, fish, bird, dog, louse, which is, uh, a, you know, a fly type of uh, insect. Um, tree, seed, leaf, root, bark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nose, body parts, aspects of nature, and uh, any given person's immediate environment. Now, of course, you include you. Hold on, we're, we're, we're going to that. You got claw, foot, hand. Again, parts mm -hmm. of the body: heart, liver, drink, eat. Everybody eats. Everybody sees. Hear, no, sleep, die, kill, et cetera, et cetera. And the more you look at this, you looking, you looking like, okay, this is just 
Zane in ancient Egyptian does not look like it's cotton. Like at all. Like at I all. haven't I haven't seen one. <laughs> I mean, I, I I would give them the first three pronouns, I, you, and we, but those pronouns are tricky because in Indo-Europeans, yeah. in Indo-European languages, I mean, we got me, <laughs> and we, you know what I'm saying? We got, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, uh, chance resemblances and, and pronouns that you just kind of, you mostly want to stay away from that. Now, what I could have did, I could have put Semitic, yeah. I could have put Berber, I could have put um, other languages beside ancient Egyptian. But you know, I'm, I'm you know, we're gonna save that for later. You know, but this is for the audience again. Like you can see right here, that none of that looks. I mean, it just doesn't look the same. Like sounds like the same. Again, all right. So, can the origin of African languages uh, proposed model be corroborated chronologically with migrations and archaeology? Emphatically, and, uh, emphatically claim. <clears throat> because right here, Emboli says it is hardly necessary to mention that the results obtained are in perfect agreement with the archaeological and cultural facts currently available. After 2010, this is what he's saying. Perfect. <laughs> now, is that not absolute language? Perfect. Like, I mean, like, this is some Mortal Kombat, like, perfect. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> okay. So if you make the claim that what I'm saying is perfect, hey, if I find one little chink in your armor, that means you are incorrect. One. Just one little chink. This is why scholars stay away from absolute language. If you say it's impossible, it's, it's indisputable, whatever's mm -hmm. true. Go ahead. Somebody uh, I, I, was, I was just gonna say, uh, it, it sounds very much like um, self gratification and trying to position yourself and couch yourself to be a legend. Like that, that meant more to him than being correct. <laughs> oh, Chris, hey, all right. Look, you, you're giving away the rest of the presentation, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what he was doing. Exactly. Um, and he, and he basically said it. But if he you gave are, away the rest of the presentation. I mean, look at what he's saying right there. <laughs> I mean, it's right there. I mean, you're right. It's right there. Like, per, like, like. You come to the conclusion that you know, what you're saying are is, is in perfect agreement with the current archaeological and cultural facts. It, it, even take for instance the archaeological and cultural facts as of right now, most of it, well, not most of it, but some of that stuff is still disputed when you talk about Africa, especially like the central Africa area that's dealing with the forest and, and, and the right and the um the, the humid part of Africa because of, of the rate of decomposition of, of artifacts, human remains, that archaeologists don't find enough evidence. But we, we still got a clear, pretty good, clear picture of what may have happened in the past. But you see mm -hmm. the verbiage that I'm using. He says it's perfect agreement. All right, so cool. So that means if I find any discrepancy, but but uh, in contrast to this perfect agreement, that means that he's wrong. Yeah. Okay. I see where I see what you're saying. Yeah. Any any little thing goes any. in perfect. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> we ain't gonna play semantics with with perfect now. Perfect means perfect. All right. So you got uh, Hausa smoking in northern Nigeria, southern Niger. Mm -hmm. and so he's, what he's doing course. here is showing the location of these languages um, that he's using in the book. Sango, Sango, smoking in the Bogan River Basin in um, Central Africa. Zande also smoking in the same general area as Sango. 
but including parts of the South Sudan, uh, and, and you have Somali that's spoken in the Horn of Africa in uh, Somaliland. And of course, you got Middle Egyptian, and which I include Coptic, which they include as a separate language, which is just asinine. But okay, so since and Bowley's model is in perfect agreement with the current archaeological and historical facts. All right, so we, we on the right side, I got this map from my brother, um, my brother Geechee. On the left side, we got in Bowley's maps. It shows migration at the top left corner of Somali, Coptic, Zerma, Wolof, Shango, Nuer, and Lua. And the bottom left is Bambara, Hauja, uh, Zande, Middle Egyptian, Parabantu, Bantu, and other Bantu. So, again, perfect agreement. Before okay. you, yeah, before go, ahead, you go, go, I just wanted people to look at the map. He's, he's saying that, you know, that they, they've all kind of migrated out of that the upper Sudan region. And they came from the south, bro. The Afrocentric. They came from the south. That, <laughs> that south. That, that's exactly what he's doing right there on yeah. that left side on both maps. You both maps too, yeah. Exactly. So, all right. I can say Somalian ancestry, for example. So scholars have reconstructed Proto-Somalian languages that have determined that they're based off their subsistence. In addition to linguistics, that the direct ancestors, direct ancestors of Somalians were familiar with camels circa 3000 BCE. However, in Negro Egyptian's model, um, Somali, which is the uh, ancestors of Somali, and there is no mention of camels in in that model, which is important because the camels allow the Somalians or Proto-Somalians. Uh, with, with or Proto Sam people that includes Rendile, which is a, a, a lowland Eastern Cushitic language, they allow them to, pretend, to, to penetrate the desert and inhabit what they call Somali land right now. Also, there's no evidence that Hausa, ancient Egyptians, Sade, Sango people raised or interacted with camels. So, in yeah. Negro Egyptian, is the proto language, proto ancestor of Somalis, then that means that somebody in Negro Egyptian should have some familiarity with camels. And that's just not the case. No, nowhere in this book that I, I ain't gonna say nowhere. From what I read in this book, I didn't see anything about camels. And but I only have to read the book to understand about camels because the uh, archaeological record indicates that camels came from somewhere the, the the tame domesticated camels came from somewhere in between Arabia and the Horn of Africa somewhere in that region somewhere not pinpointing a exact location but somewhere so for Somalians to descend from Omotana languages from Lowland Eastern Cushitic languages, um, you can see that the previous branches of Cushitic had no dealings with camels on a domesticated level. But the Proto Sound people, as you can see right here, is Rendile, Boni, and Somali. They had words for camel, which is Gaul, words for young camel, which is Kalim, words for a camel bell, which is Kor and other words within proto sound that's dealing with camels. Negro Egyptian, on the other hand, nothing. So on this right side, you see the ancestors to Somalians, which is in Boley's map, which is dealing with proto Somali. You don't, I mean, I don't, I haven't read anything in this book dealing with Somalis, but I mean, excuse me, camels. But if you look at his left side, this map over here. Um, this is a map from Christopher Eric, considered prehistory, dealing with proto-sound people and how 
proto Sam people that deals with Rendell and Boney and Somali languages, they all have or they have similar terms dealing with uh, raising camels and domesticating camels. So if your if if Mboli's model is per, in perfect agreement with archaeology, where are the mention of camels? So moving right along. All right, so all right, check this out. So Mboli is willing to accept Proto Bantu Hausa Fulani. Uh, but it's incorrect on a couple of, of bullet points that I made on the left side that the Falana people are thought to have originated somewhere in the Green Sahara. Uh, in contrast to Negro Egyptians, and, and you see in Sudan or East Africa or Ethiopia, cave art in North Central Sahara reflects modern day Falana rituals. According to Mboli's very own model, Bantu and Hausa originated in. Ethiopia and East Africa, it contradicts the earlier declaration that is hardly necessary. Again, that um, archae the archaeological and cultural facts available and are in perfect agreement. So, um, Geechee, Brother Geechee, I know, I know you're well versed on Fulani history. If you want to go in on that, I don't think he's on here right now. Or, uh, I think brother and goes on here. I don't, I don't. I think he on here. I don't know. But anyway, um, and Boli says, regardless of the level of rigor that is imposed in this work, it is clear that it has built the theory of proto Bantu Hausa Fulani, since it has succeeded in making forecasts which testable uh, have been confirmed by the facts the Egyptian facts that she was unaware of completely from the beginning to the end of his work. Um, yeah, that's just a, another flaw. Like, Fulani people have just a totally different ancestry um, mm -hmm. from the other branches of Negro Egyptian. Hey, yo, hold on. I, I got I got to jump off real quick. Hey, go, go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So here he's saying that the Ubangian history, uh, is it from the east or is it from the west? Um, uh, so I believe we, the next slide should show um, where they come from. Let's see. All right, Brother Geetzi, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to speak on as far as the Fulani and their, their origins, as well as whether or not they share any uh, connection uh, to Hausa, Somali, Zande? Well, the Fulani, the, the, the closest language the Fulani were related to was Siri, Siri, and, and Wolof. Mm -hmm. as far as linguistically, you know what I'm saying, but genetically they'd be related to the Siri Siri people and also the the Sankai people uh, through their uh, through a lot of uh, maternal maternal lineages. Yeah. Which is you know what I'm saying, which is got give them their central their central Sudanic uh, their central Sudanic uh, connection. Mm -hmm. With the uh, with 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 the Chadic people, because the Chadic people also have a uh, like a like a Nilo-Saharian substratum within a you know within a people too. Okay. Um. So before Brother Jesse gets back, on the next slide, he's going to show these migrations uh, between uh, the Bantu and the Ubangan. Uh, he's going to show okay. that. I'll just let you know that you're going to show the influences of those migrations, such as uh, food supplies, such as yams, 
uh, bananas and you know other yeah. crops and things like that. Yeah, even uh, like uh, a lot of people, a lot of people. Uh, that's another thing. A lot of people always mention the Bantu uh, expansion, but they don't they don't really understand that the Bankians was traveling too. Yeah, was going into the interior too. Yeah. Mm. Yo, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah we here. All right, all right, I don't. I had something. I don't know what was discussed. Yeah, we, we were talking about the next slide where you, we're talking about that food influences this uh, the Ubangian and Bantu uh, movements. Uh, so if you yeah. go to the next uh, section, you'll see it. It, it will show up on the screen here. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the I'm on the call, so I really can't see the slide slides. I, uh, we have some technical difficulties difficulties with the app. I could see the app, but you know, so I couldn't hear nothing on there. Ah, uh, okay. All right, yeah, I'll definitely send you the uh, slide so you can have it. All right, Brother Josh, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, hey Brother yeah. Josh. Oh, okay, he's back, okay. Yeah, I'm okay. back. All right, right. Tristan. Oh, I was just Go gonna ahead, say, Geechee made me think of something when he was talking about and and the Ubangans, it's like um, if Mboli is to take away Afro-Asiatic, how does that affect the Nilo-Saharan and the other the other groups, the Chadic and like like in other words, does he account for the the changes, the drastic changes that would be if you were to just remove Afro-Asiatic? Because it's not a clean cut that you could just take. Afro-Asiatic, to my knowledge, you would have I mean, to account, you would have to account for the other changes in the other families, the other parts of the he's, family. He's not he's not counting them. So here's the thing: the the whole purpose of Negro Egyptian, remember, it's it's ethnic it's ethnically based. Uh, so if they don't ethnically fit, uh, he's not counting them in. This is why he wants to dispute. Um, the Coptic, he has to separate that from Egyptian. He also doesn't talk about Arabic and he very minusculely talks about Semitic. So he's isolating them as their own language, not part of a language yeah. group. And That's crazy! Oh my it god! Is. Like, it is. It is. He hypo-lumping he, he hypo, he hypo lumping, lumping stuff together. Right. Oh, That's crazy! Oh, man. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, y'all yeah, yeah, ain't seen nothing yet now. But, <laughs> but check this out. All right. I, don't yeah, know so I, was, you, I was telling them about the next slide where okay. uh, food was used to show the migration okay. with the Bantu and the Ubangians. Okay. So you can go to the next yeah. slide. They yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Check this out. So, okay. So, okay. Ubangian history um, from east to west. Now, I'm going to show you why this is a problem. Hold on. Let me click on her. All right. So to the right, John Claude and Bowling. The following evidence, the, the following fact, evidence of banana cultivation was found in Southern Cameroon around 1000 BCE, knowing that banana cultivation was introduced to Africa through the East Coast of the continent, some point around 3000 BC. This destroys instantly every notion of Bantu eastward uh, uh, migration from the Cameroon by the means of agriculture practices. It is the other way around. It needs to be considered. All right, so I ain't even got to like press to the next slide. But bananas for for everybody listening in antiqu antiquity, they do not show up very well in the in the archaeological record. Say that again. Bananas do not show up very well in the archaeological record so um and that's part of the reason why it's highly disputed now they do find evidence that it maybe was cultivated in east africa around 3000 bc but this is the reason why so All right, so I, right I, before Go you ahead. see i disagree with the fact that they were cultivated uh in east africa i think that's an ongoing dispute is that they're trying to differentiate between bananas and plantains. 
I, I agree more so with plantains, but we all know that bananas didn't necessarily originate uh, yep. in Africa. So yep. I think you, you have to really, uh, I would go more so with the argument of plantains coming from uh, the East more so than bananas. That's just my personal dispute with that. Yeah, yeah. And, and see, that's the problem with the West African date a uh, 1000 BCE in, in uh, Cameroon because mm -hmm. they, right now, it's still a dispute whether or not it's a plantain or a banana right now. Now, I mean, it, it goes back and forth. But, I mean, right here, this, this destroys instantly every notion. That's an absolute language. Like, you have to stay away from it if you're a scholar. So, why do we say that Ubangian history comes from the East? Okay, so number one bullet point is both the Bantu and Ubangian migrations were contemporary with each other. Um, my source on that is uh, is Christopher Air. You'll see later on, but it's not the only one. It's the reason. It's the reason why Bantu and Ubangi migrations were contemporary with each other because yams were a major part of, or not only Ubangi and Bantu people, but also Niger Congo people. So if you're dealing with a proto language or what academia does with a proto language and what did a proto people eat, what did they hunt, how did they live, what it called subsistence. How they sustain themselves, um, they dealt with yams in West Africa. So, where is the center of domestication of the yam in West Africa? The yam that we know it is in West Africa, and you'll see the the bullet or the excuse me, the source for that. Number four, the introduction of bananas is from Africa, of uh, in Africa from Asia is also included with the taro and the water yam which is known as, together, the, the banana, the, the taro, and the yam is, is called the Asian trio. Now, you dealing with Ubangian and Bantu people, it's, it's pretty much uh, a known consensus that the taro and the water yam coming from East Asia was introduced to Bantu and Ubangian people. You know what I'm saying? So it's not... If, if they were from the, the East Coast or the Horn of Africa, they would have had those crops and being familiar with it and not being introduced to it later on in history. Number five, other West African Ooh. crops uh, also indicate a Western homeland for Bantu people and the Bargain people, such as the African oil palm and the bush candle. Now, everybody, you can get on your Googles right now, look up the African oil palm, look up the bush candle, and look at the most diverse region of the African oil palm and the, and the bush palm, excuse me, the African oil palm and the bush counter, you find that, that it's in like Nigeria and Cameroon in West Central Africa. Okay. So if you look at the proto languages and what these proto people eat and exploit, they exploited the African oil palm and the bush counter. And if I'm not mistaken, the bush candle is also a deterrent of type 2 diabetes that a lot of West Africans have, well, excuse me, not West Africans, but uh, African Americans have today. It's like when we were separated from that bush candle, all of a sudden, here comes type 2 diabetes. But in West Africa, where they still export the bush candle, um, they don't have a prevalence of type 2 diabetes with the exception of uh, an American fast food chain. But that's neither here or there, but I'm just saying, <laughs> drawing that connection. Uh -huh. number so, so number six though, now th this is something that I'm probably, sh you know, pretty sure that the conscious community is not aware of. It's the mm -hmm. spread of three distinct strand of what they call a, a helicobacter pylori strand of a virus uh, associated with Bantu migrations. So Helicobacter uh, pylori is an intestinal viral infection that's passed on to humans, from human to human. And most people catch it 
while they're infants, just like chicken pox, so to speak. Yeah. But um, within the virus, uh, it mutates and it, it, it deals with antibodies and other deterrents and it comes what comes up with a mutation. So, so with uh, the HP Africa one mutation, that's associated with Bantu migrations. Yep, that's a stomach virus too, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a stomach virus. And again, that that's another <laughs> that's another shot at the whole Bantu coming from the East uh, argument as well. Look it up. Helicobacter pylori. Yeah, it's right now. HP Africa 1 associated with Bantu migrations. It also so, has some microbial causes too. You could definitely take a look into that. Exactly. I mean, I mean but but on the con the continent of Africa in particular, they have different strands. Mm -hmm. They have different time depths if we're dealing with how viruses and genes mutate to to fend off said uh, environmental pressure or what what have you. That you can see the helicobacter uh, pylori um, when dealing with the Bantu migrations occurred about 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, right around the time of the Bantu migration. Okay, okay. So the disease is helping the time stamp to show the, the dates of the migrations that is real. That yep. we, we, can, we ain't just pop up. In West Africa, like a like a plant growing from the ground, and we just showed up in West Africa. Like, nah, we had migration. Hey, uh, Gitty, you got some noise in the background. Ah, okay. So, so the no, 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 no. is basically a, a timestamp showing that these migrations are real. That, that we'd be talking about, and we didn't just kind of sprout up in West Africa on some like yeah. mythical yeah, shit. Yeah, because because you know, because according to the other side, that you can't use genetics for migration patterns and and blah 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 because this and that and third. Now you gotta take into consideration the context of what we're talking about. Thousands of years ago, we 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 did not have Delta. We didn't have Southwestern Airlines. We didn't have. <laughs> Air Africa, you, you, we didn't have all that shit. Like so, traveling was not a thing. All you know what? Today I, I feel like going from from right, right. You know what I'm saying? Have, like we, we, we have Toyota or Mercedes or none of that. And you no, gotta take like, food. You gotta take food with you too. Keep that in mind, especially if you have children and you're moving. It's almost like how our early our early ancient ancestors moved. How they you know would grab. You know whatever they needed at the time, and then uh, moved along the country. So I think it's crucial. It, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And, really. and, and, and it, it, it points to a West African origin of the Ubangian and the Bantu people. But you know the Bantu people, I'm gonna just let go right now because we got some stuff in the chamber when it comes to the Bantu people. But the Ubangian people dealing with what we talking about right now in the context of John Claude and Boley and his book right now, like that that East African stuff, as of right now, what they ate and how they lived and et cetera, et cetera, it, it points to a West African origin. Now, well, Europeans, this Europeans that if you want to look at a European source, um, here we go right here. Proto Indo European trees. Why is this important? Because Proto Indo Europeans on the 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 Pontic Cat Caspian uh the Caspian steppes of of uh, Eurasia came from a, a particular point, which is pinpointed by a lot of scholars. And what they do is 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 a synthesis of genetics, archaeology, and linguistics to say, okay, they most likely came from this area. What's in this area? What did they eat? What did they exploit? What trees did they see? What type of environment? They saw snow. They saw wolves. They domesticated wolves and, and eventually got dogs. 
Um, they saw wild horses. They developed the way they, they domesticated wild horses into uh, tame or domesticated horses. Um, they developed the wheel, and they seen um, they seen birch, birch trees, pine trees, apple trees, et cetera, et cetera. So, if you have a question about, well, how do you determine what a proto people ate, saw, and sustained themselves? Here's a book right here, Proto Indo European uh, Trees by Paul Friedrich. And this right here just, okay. So throughout the book, he talks about how Semitic and Egyptian only has similarities because of prior contact. Oh, Middle Egyptian had contact with Semitic Semites and vice versa. But in his book, he'll say that Semites borrowed everything from Negro Egyptians. But you got right here, verified context between Arabs and the Zande. The, the, the Zande actually spoke and, and written and wrote in, in, in Arabic. This is verified. Like you can look up this source right here. The use of Arabic as a written language in Central Africa, the case of Uele Basin in Northern Congo in the late 19th century, they actually wrote and, and spoke uh Arabic. They were Muslims. So it's like they were immersed in a Semitic culture. Now does the author take into account of that? I don't think so. That's just another key point you can you could uh consider if anybody wants to want to interject before I move on to the next I, I, I don't I don't know in Boley's works and stuff like that, but does he show any equivalent um, groups that are writing in this Negro Egyptian to show, like, to, to support what he talking about? Oh, no. Egyptian, the only ones writing in, in, in anything, bro. Oh, man. I know. I, I was I was disappointed, too, after reading 600 pages of straight-up BS, but, hey, whatever. All right. The concordance between Semitic and the Negro Egyptian language are more numerous in the field of grammar, but as the case of vocabulary, in no way are they genetic in nature and explained best by borrowing uh, the facts of Negro Egyptian, the fact that total absence of etymology of Semitic most friends are concerned. This is in boldly saying that, yeah, it's similar between Semitic and Egyptian, but it's because they borrowed everything. Everything, like, I, I mean, this is part of the reason why I didn't put a lot of stuff dealing with Semitic languages in here because to him, it's just, it's just borrowed. Like, it's, what's the point? But I did put some stuff in there in contrast to Zande and Sango because these are the, the two odd languages excluded from Afro-Asiatic. So, in a way, moving on, moving on, he say, okay, he says, uh, take for example, the case of Somali Dar, house, the building, and Arabic Dar. A comparator Africanist would not he have hesitated only one second to affirm that the word Somali is alone made to Arabic. We would demonstrate that it's pr precisely the opposite. I guess he's saying that uh, Arabic, the, 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 the third bullet point, Arabic Dar is absolutely isolated and Semitic and the Arabic Dar has no etymology in Semitic, and Arabic Dar does not explain the presence of long uh, vowels in Somali. So if you look at the examples to the right, you see that uh, Dar, or Arabic whatever uh, house, does have etymology in Semitic, and it also explains the long vowel in Somali. So those long words like uh, Saharak, uh, sincerity, uh, that, that Arabic uh, long vowel um, translates into a Somali long vowel, and et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the other examples, you see what I'm talking about. So when you say in the third bullet point that is absolutely isolated in Semitic, that's, that's clearly not the case. 
and Arabic Dar does not explain the presence of some modern vibes. That's not the case. Like, I mean, I don't know what to say besides warning everybody listening and aspiring scholars. Don't use absolute language when you're dealing with scholarship. So that's in incorrect. Any field, in any yeah, field. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the field, bro. <laughs> like, like this one right here. Okay. LaShawn or the word for tongue. He says it's a proto-Bantu prefix. And, of course, he made a reconstruction. See, this is an example of the reconstructions in chapter six and seven and eight that I just did not want to flood you guys with. Okay, so he says, oh, this is a prefix. The, the, the Lee prefix is a Bantu and the S is a suffix, blah, blah, blah. And he says right here, these are the facts. But you're going right here. Uh, I got it uh, right here. Egyptian tongue with various Afro-Asiatic cognates. You got the sources right here. You even got Semitic cognates with Egyptian tongue and body parts ending with N. Uh, the distribution of tongue in Berber, Chadic, Egyptian cognates suggests a common origin with proto-Semitic. And it's been postulated since the 1800s. And of course, uh, the saying that uh, that Lee is a what well, Li is a proto semitic well, excuse me, a, a Bantu prefix is just is incorrect. I don't know what else to say. Like, I mean, you got the amounts of evidence right here to the right, and you have in bonus evidence to the left. But you can see in Semitic languages alone that that's not. A prefix. The Lee is not a uh, is not a prefix. You can see this. The 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 N is a suffix of many body parts. In contrast to what Emboli says it is. Mm -mm. So, uh, this is this ain't looking good. This is not looking good. I don't like this, man. <laughs> it, it, it gets worse, bro. I'm trying to speed up through it. It gets worse. Oh, the 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 Tanu. Or the Tamahu, or whatever you want to call them, they are not white. But according to Mbola, they are white. They are Proto Berber, uh, 3,000 years before Jesus Christ or BC. They arrived in Africa, according to him. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, the Amazigh or the Berber people are, are not African. But it, it's crazy ironic that he calls the Berber people not African. We're not considering that Berber people share a similar ancestry with Egyptians. Very similar. And, and yes. even some sub Saharans. And we got some yeah. of the same paternal markers. Yep. Yep. Th th this has all been proved in in, in Boli's time. Th this is why this is crazy. Yep. Like like Berbers migrated just like us through inside of Africa. So it's not like they just showed up. Yep. Yep. Uh, he, he calls him the Tehenu and um, yeah, the local population came to add white populations, and that's how you got the the Tehenu. But just just overlook that the closest people to the the transcontinental region of Egypt are Egyptians themselves. Just overlook that fact and just say, all right, those people from the outside skipped over Egyptians just went and intermingled with Berbers and that's how we got light skinned Berbers today. But wow. Egyptians are black. <laughs> wow. All right, exactly. All right, so moving on. So the the Negro Egyptian influence Proto Indo European, page five eighteen, the to our greatest surprise, it is the reverse, which is the product, the roots of Indo European that it can be considered as borrowed from Negro Egyptian are much more numerous and some even belong to the basic vocabulary of Negro Egyptian. Page 518. All right, so now this that is, is that is a bold statement. It's a very bold statement, but you know, if you remember, he said this, this is a very modest, very modest uh, 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 undertaking. This is what he said. Anyway. All right, so you see right here, he has 
different etymologies of proto Indo European with Negro Egyptian. Uh, he has heart with uh, I don't know see see these reconstructions. I don't know what that is, but the word they use for Middle Egyptian, excuse me, is a recent innovation. Come over here to number forty. The word for woman, like he equates proto European urine, uh, woman with a uh, Negro Egyptian being fat. Like I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm confused by that. Like, <laughs> like what type of semantic? Like you call him? I, I don't know what I don't know what he's trying to say. But fat and women obviously go together. Hey, I didn't Belly write it. Too. Belly uh, too. Uh, and, and belly <laughs> like that. I think mean, that's crazy. <laughs> hey, what can I say? I didn't write it. Uh, all right. So, in connecting Proto Indo European and, and uh, Egyptian, look at this. You got wolf, number eight. You got wolf. Uh, this is typical Proto Indo European word, also carries Negro just prefix. W, if you want to bring it closer to Negro Egyptian, see, now, now here, here goes this reconstruction with a reconstruction. Whatever you see, uh, Ash, 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 you, you, this is a reconstruction with a reconstruction. And he, he compares that with a ferocious beast, and he compares elephant uh, with the link between wolf and elephant. And this is what I mean by semantically way. Like, don't, just, just don't mind comparing.